remembering the Yarnell fire, no more Dunkin' Donuts, gonna answer some of your questions in the mailbag, and we're gonna hit verse of the day. This is episode five of the Gideon's Tactical Show. Well, hey folks, welcome to another episode here of the Gideon's Tactical Show. Really excited for this particular episode. Got a lot to talk through, interesting facts, a true story that's really interesting and worth your time investigating some more and uh, going to answer your questions. Just going to have a blast today. And uh, don't want to forget to remind you guys and thank you for your continued support through the hyperlinks that we offer to you guys over to Amazon and Blade HQ. When you buy any gear through those links that we offer in the description below, really helps us out to continue to do what we do here, make content just like this and the videos that you see all week long, regardless if it's a particular item being reviewed or any gear in general, it really helps us out when you use those hyperlinks. Man, I have this like frog in my throat. The weather is changing. Uh, the temperature dropped by about 20 degrees here uh, in the Rocky Mountains on the last uh, day. So it's a, a big temperature swing and I can kind of feel it a little bit. Some of you guys, by the way, were asking about these Black Rifle coffee mugs. I'm digging these a lot. I'm thinking about getting a subscription to Black Rifle Coffee to have them ship coffee to me regularly. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a Stanley made and I love Stanley products. And then, you know, they got a Black Rifle. I think I paid $40 for this thing. Uh, it is over on their website. Some of you were saying you couldn't find it. Just look in their mugs, dig around. It's there. I checked just like a day or two ago. Um, and you can get them if you don't need the logo or you know, you're just kind of interested in it. I think they're about 30 bucks on Amazon. I'll have those in those links I just talked about below. But I really like them a lot. This is a really cool kind of unique mug. I use it a lot for a lot of different beverages, hot and cold. But if you're into black rifle coffee like me, the, their their edition is pretty sick, and I like the logo on there. So we're gonna jump right into it here with this kind of news story that uh, is near and dear to my family's heart. And that's not necessarily me, but for uh, Mrs. Gideon's tactical, is that Dunkin' Donuts is no more. They are dropping the word donut from their name. Now they're just gonna be known as. Duncan and uh, I was digging around this is off of Business Insider and uh, just kind of read the article real briefly just kind of skimmed it from what I understand they're just wanting to expand a little bit not tied down to the word donut even though they in fact came up with the spelling that we now know of D-O-N-U-T for donut or donuts um, they came up with that you know it used to be back before the 1950s spelled dough and then nut and you put those together not D-O. Uh, and really because of their business and just some other things that they did, they really got it added to the Webster's Dictionary. It became how most people will spell the, the word donut. But they have decided to drop the, the name and they're just going to now be Duncan. Now, uh, this is kind of near and dear to my family's heart because my wife, Mrs. Giddings Tactical, uh, she grew up with Dunkin' Donuts. She loves Dunkin' Donuts. I'm kind of, you know, 50-50. I'm like, yeah, it's a cool donut shop. Nothing like, you know, blows my mind with their donuts, but they're good. Um, and uh, she loves them though. This is the donut shop that she kind of grew up with in a small town in Pennsylvania. And when I told her, hey, they're dropping the donuts off of Dunkin', she was like stunned. She's like, what? Uh, but I get it. It's not a huge deal. I think a lot of people refer to them anyway that way. I think I do most of the time when I'm referring to the shop. I'm just like Dunkin'. I don't say Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so Dunkin' is what they're going to be known as. You'll probably be seeing the shift soon. I think they're just not wanting to be pigeonholed in the donut mentality that they're wanting to spread out a little bit. But interesting. You will see that coming to a Dunkin' Donuts near you and it will now just be Dunkin'. And I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Is that something that really bothers you? Is that like, oh my gosh, earth shaking? Or are you like, yeah, it totally makes sense. That's what I call them anyway. So love to hear your guys' thoughts on whether or not Dunkin' Donuts dropping the word donuts off of their company name is a big deal to you or not. Well, it's time for our history rewind. And this is going to be kind of a sombering um, moment just to kind of... Uh, remember but also think about the the consequences and just how you can better um, keep the devastation of a wildfire a forest fire from affecting people's lives in your life um, the, I came across this a little while ago originally off of outside online's uh, website they did a story on the one survivor of a 20-man hotshot crew out of Yarnell, Arizona, in that kind of area. Um, and uh, 20 hot shots went into this fire and uh, only one survived. They got encircled, they got trapped by this wildfire. They had to set up their fire shelters. Um, it was not enough and only one man came out alive. The other 19 passed away in the fire. And uh, it's just, it was the deadliest wildfire uh, since 1991. So it had gone and this had happened back in 2015, I believe, 2000. 
2013, excuse me, of uh, June 28, 2013 is when uh, it first began. And I'm getting this based off of not only Outside Online's uh, website, I am looking also on firehouse.com and then um, Wikipedia as well, just kind of using all three of those together just to have my information in front of me. Those uh, uh, are my general resources. But this happened down in Arizona um, near Yarnell Hill and uh, it was not only a harrowing experience, uh, meaning that the, that one man, you know, was able to walk out alive um, and, you know, had to lose all of his friends in that scenario. But um, really, it's a, a really uh, recent, you know, story that's a true story that has a lot of things that you can take away from it. So I'm going to have a lot of links in the description below, um, not only over to a couple uh, YouTube videos that I've found, and you can just, you know, Google Yarnell uh, Hill Fire, and you can, um, you know, you can YouTube it, you can watch a couple documentaries. I'll, I'll have a link over to the Outside Online website where they did a, an article about this and a story, true story about the survivor and um, how he tells the story and stuff. It's a, it's a very, um, it's, it's a good read and it's just a, a solemn reminder, one, that life is so fleeting. You can wake up one morning never thinking that uh, it's the last day of your life, but also um, just to never forget to tell the people around you how much that you care for them, how much you love them, because you never know if you'll ever have that chance again that either you or they um, you know, may be gone in a blink of an eye and you may not be able to tell them how much they meant to you and uh, that type of thing. But uh, also just, to, it was just kind of a, a real reminder for me, you know, I'm an outdoorsman, I love going outdoors, backpacking, camping, hiking, all that, and do a lot of um, open fires, you know, do fire pits. And I do that year round, but uh, in the Rocky Mountains where I live, it can be very dry. And so I am very conscientious of the fire bans, and I never want to start a fire or anything when there's a ban or, you know, super high if it's rated high, you know, I, um, on the fire warnings and stuff and restrictions. I never want to do anything like that and possibly start a forest fire. And, and But me having fun and, you know, cooking and boiling water over a fire and, you know, making my coffee or something on a day hike is not worth burning down a forest and possibly losing um, not only, you know, wildlife and vegetation, but then also, um, uh, you know, property as well as possibly people's lives. So I just encourage you always be smart. And it drives me nuts when I do see people breaking the law and, you know, they're, they're out there, you know, having a fire. And I'm like, dude, there's a fire ban around. What are you doing? Um, so that always drives me nuts. So just be smart, particularly if you're in some of those drier areas of the West, particularly, and know your uh, restrictions and whether or not you can burn. Just be smart. Put out your fire. Make sure it's out. That's why we like doing a lot of reviews here on the um, entrenching tools and shovels so you can really, you know, you don't just have to use water. You can really get some dirt or snow or whatever and put out fires um, that way. But there's also a second side of that, that that also does frustrate me is that, and this is just me talking based off of observation, that there are certain areas that I believe and the Forest Service has done a good job in some ways of starting to clear and make slash piles and, and cut down dead trees because we do have a lot of beetle kill and stuff like that in the Rocky Mountains and certain sections of uh, Colorado where I live that, you know, half to almost two thirds of the forest you look on a hillside is just dead. And it's just asking for a lightning strike or a spark or some doofus up there, you know, doing a fire when he shouldn't be to just light that whole hill on fire and, you know, destroy what is there. And I know that fires are, you know, a natural process. I'm not saying that we should like totally protect it because I think that we're actually reaping some of the, the damage in the West from the last maybe 20, 30 years of su such tight regulations and no, um, allowing of not deforestation but you know just uh, collecting wood and cutting down dead trees and you know removing that and doing you know controlled burns that there's been such a fear of wildfires that we've stopped doing a lot of that and just kind of leaving everything as it is and then it gets you know and in, in it gets really dangerous and so i do really hope that um the states particularly in the western part of the united states and, you know maybe you live i know australia had some really bad wildfires uh, a few years ago parts of europe you know different just wherever you are you know that drier areas of the of the world that um it i really hope the government that you know control either states or you know um principalities whatever um that they get a good game plan that's smart and you know based off of conservation but also 
um, will help to burn up dead stuff that needs to die so that new healthy stuff can grow and not just leave dead stuff hanging around for you know a couple decades and then when there is finally a fire it like literally torches a whole state torches a whole region and you know is just devastating to the population and to wildlife versus doing smart controlled burns and removing you know uh, letting you know permits go out to collect wood if that's certain places where you live or whatever so that's just something that's been on my mind a lot that I hope not only governments get figured out so that we don't have to reap the consequences years later like we kind of are in the in the western states and I believe in the last few years but also possibly just remembering this Yarnell fire and the loss of life with those firefighters and uh, those hot shots and everything that that goes on with that um, for yourself just be smart when you're playing with fire out in the woods be smart about it and always put it out once you're done and uh, you know don't burn when it's too dry to to watch the embers go so uh, that's my uh, little take here on the history rewind that happened five years ago this past June all right next up we're gonna hit the mailbag but before we do just want to remind you guys about our knock around sunglass affiliate as well we just recently did a giveaway on that and that was a blast Guys, we love knock around sunglasses, not only from my own hometown, where they're originally from, and where I'm originally from, and then I moved out to the Rocky Mountains, and uh, love them. They really perform well. You know, I threw down my hard earned money on the front end before we ever got an affiliate with them, and then I reached out and got an affiliate because I like the glasses so much. They have them for the entire family. They have custom store, they have lots of different designs, polarized, UV protection, and all under 50 bucks. Great stuff. You don't want to miss out on a knock around sunglass if you're in the market for an inexpensive sunglass pair for yourself or a family member. They, they, they rock. I don't know about you. Uh, I have always steered away from expensive sunglasses you know that uh, are either going to get stepped on dropped scratched played with my kids and broken or whatever so uh, that's why i really like knockarounds they're not going to break the bank but they really perform well so check out those links as well to help continue to support the channel you guys are amazing and rock so now we're going to do a couple of these questions the first one comes from old gecko old gecko been following us for a while here and uh, this is an older question that he asked about a month ago but besides the first and Second Amendment, which I both love and are very important to the U.S. Constitution, which one do you believe in most? I really like that question. That was a really good question. And so uh, the Fourth Amendment, I'm just going to read this real quick for us, is one that is near and dear to my heart because it, it uh, protects you from unwarranted search and seizure. The right for a person to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable search and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall be issued but upon uh, probable cause supported by oath or affirm uh, affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So it has to be ex extremely spe specific. And I'm really glad that the Founding Fathers put that in the Constitution. And, you know, there's a lot of countries around the world have nothing like this. And it's really sad because someone can just burst in your house and take whatever they want, do whatever they want without any proof. And proof is something that's extremely important to me or any sort of like cor corroborating evidence. Um, you know, witnesses, those type of things, so that if people see something that they just don't like that I'm doing, if they have no proof, they're just like, I know I don't like that guy. Um, this guy has something. Go check out his house. And, you know, they kick down the door and, you know, tie my family up and take all my papers and, you know, head out the door and take me off to prison. That can't happen under the Fourth Amendment. And regardless of them in the house or out of the house, and when there is a warrant, it has to be specific. They can't just say, yeah, whatever you want. It has to be like for the computer, for uh, the basement, you know, like whatever it is, it has to be um, pretty specific when they are filing for a warrant. I really appreciate that amendment. That one speaks to me on a major level that keeps us from getting, you know, into, um, you know, some sort of totalitarian state. The Fourth Amendment, Old Gecko, great question. All right, this next one comes from Sawyer Harter, Harter, um, and uh, Sawyer asks, have you ever had an MRE? Uh, I had one one time a long time ago, with some military buddies of mine, probably a decade ago, and it was okay. Um, I should probably get some more of them, test out some more of them, and see just what they have to offer, but I have not. I, it's not something that I regularly eat, store, or use. All right, and our next question comes from Daniel Rutham. Uh, Daniel asks for the woods use for you woods use 
Do you prefer a hawk, hatchet, or a large chopping knife? Fantastic question. This is gonna be a way deeper conversation than what we're gonna to do today. But um, as of late, when I'm going out in the woods, I have found myself really gravitating to a lightweight, well-ground uh, hatchet over a chopper and over a tomahawk. I have not yet found a tomahawk that really makes sense to me. Maybe one day I will. And though I love, and do not get me wrong, big knives do not suck. They rock and as a one tool option, a well-balanced large uh, knife is way better than a hatchet in my opinion because you can just do more with it. But um, I'm gravitating more to when I'm out there of doing like a four and a half inch fixed blade, five inch to four and a half inch cutting edge fixed blade, I'll, my S-Wings hatchet that I'm just like in love with for some reason, uh, and then like a really good larger, you know, saw. And that is like my go-to and I'm loving it. So um, that's kind of how I'm doing it right now. I I really need to like sit down, break down the whole system and really think through that. But that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Uh, you know, I am really enjoying it. All right, so don't forget about the mailbag. If you guys possibly want to get your questions answered in an upcoming either Gideon's Tactical Show episode or possibly in an upcoming review, just put hashtag mailbag, ask your questions. Get outside the box, guys. Think of things that are not just gear related. Think of things that you'd want to hear from me, concepts, ideas, my thoughts on particular topics, you know, whatever that maybe do not have to do just with the outdoors love and those pop off the screen to me and say, you know what, I think I want to answer that question. So um, yeah, hit those uh, hashtag mailbag questions below. And uh, now we're going to hit the last part of our video where we're going to talk about the verse of the day. Uh, you guys have really seemed to uh, be interested in this and enjoy this. So today's verse of the day uh, is out of Exodus 33. And this starts in verse 11. It says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp after having met with God, his assistant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. And I've been really chewing on this set of scripture for a while because what I see in this, now I'm going to focus more on Joshua. The fact that Moses could talk to God in that way face to face is amazing. Um, and I'm not going to go into the whole, you know, depth that but I believe we can still do that today and have, have a uh, relationship. And that's what God wants more than anything else, a relationship with him. Um, but, uh, What's so awesome to me is that Joshua, after Moses has met with God and goes off, Joshua is just like, dude, I, God, I just need to be in your presence. I just want to know you. I just want to be with you. And he would do that day in, day out. And he did that for 40 years while the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. And it speaks to his desire to know his heavenly father, to know his spiritual dad, God. And just to know him and to be in his presence. And I want to have that hunger. I want to have that desire with my relationship with God, with my, my relationship with my Heavenly Father uh, in that way. And that hunger and desire. And it changes the whole perspective. One of the other super famous verses, Joshua 1, 9, where God is saying to him, be strong and courageous for I am with you. And I've always viewed that in the past prior to like putting these two scripture points together of Joshua, you know, being like really nervous that he's got to now take the children of Israel. Moses has died. Moses. Moses has died. And now he's got to take the children of Israel into the promised land and, you know, take the land um, and, and take possession of what God has promised to them. And he's like, in the past, I've always viewed Joshua as like scared, nervous, and like, oh my gosh, can I do this? But when I put saw that verse, then remembered that verse, it spoke to me as like God, as like his dad encouraging his son, son, I'm with you. I've We spent 40 years together. You know me, you know, I'm with you. Let's go together. And it was, it's a way more just encouraging life giving set of relationship that I see Joshua having with God. And it's only Joshua and Caleb that go in, you know, to the promised land and all of the, the people that left Egypt, including um, Moses, you know, passed on and died in the wilderness before they could go take possession of the promise that God had given them. So anyway, guys, that's me. I just want to be like Joshua. I just want to, I want to hang out in the tent of meeting with God. I want to hang out in his presence and get to know, know him. And I encourage you to do the same. And if, if you're on the fence or you're like, I don't even know who this God guy is. I don't even know if he's real. Dude, I don't even believe in God. I would challenge you to just take a moment, take a couple, maybe take a couple times a week for a few weeks and just go, God, show yourself. If you're real, show it. Prove it. Prove it. He's proved himself to me. I know that he's real. Uh, so just ask him. Be like, hey, I'm willing to know you if you're real. Show yourself to me. 
And uh, when people do that, I hear just the craziest stories of God just showing himself real. So uh, love you guys. You're awesome. Thanks for joining us on this particular episode of Gideon's Tactical Show. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're not a current subscriber. Uh, I invite you to also check out Instagram, social media. We're throwing up stuff there all the time. And thank you for your support with the links and with the likes, thumbs up, shares, all of that. And finally, guys, always remember, stay equipped, stay prepared, and we'll see you out there.